And now we want to take a step back and look at where we are with the science of COVID-19. Every week brings us more data. Here now uh, joining us is Dr. John Brownstein, an epidemiologist at Boston Children's Hospital and an ABC News contributor. Thanks so much for joining us, doctor. Thank you. So we just discussed with John Carl, President Trump saying today that he's taking hydroxychloroquine for prevention, even though he says he has no symptoms and has tested negative for the virus. Just to use his own words where he says, what do you have to lose? It's our understanding from the scientists, you could lose your life. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's absolutely true. You could lose your life. And it's, it's unfortunate that we're sort of backtracking in the science here, right? Because clinical trials, scientific research have all shown that this drug is not effective against COVID-19. And in fact, there are potential negative consequences like heart rhythm issues and even death. So of course, this drug has been around for a long time. It's used to treat malaria and lupus, but there's no reason to be prescribing or taking it right now, given the evidence that we have today. So you would tell our viewers not to follow the president's lead here? Unfortunately, you know, the science does not line up with what the president is saying. Of course, you always need to be talking to your provider about what medications you should be taking. But currently, the clinical evidence is not in favor of this. So, yes, we should not be necessarily listening to what's happening from our president today. But the president also said today that a lot of doctors and people on the front lines take hydroxychloroquine. Is that something that you've been hearing about? You no, know, the, the providers, doctors that I work with here through the Harvard system, Nobody's taking this drug. There's a very, there's a high concern that exists across my community about this product. You know, clearly it has a time and a place to be taken, but not among frontline providers. There's a fear about the adverse events that it can cause. And they're, they're not taking it and they're not recommending it to their patients. Okay, let's move on. One key question is whether people who've had COVID-19, if you can get it again. Now, we've learned that over a dozen sailors on the USS Roosevelt tested positive after it seemed that they had recovered. So what does that latest research tell us about reinfection? Yeah, I mean, immunity is the, the big question, right? And, and you mentioned the vaccine and the issues where can the vaccine create protection if it mounts, you know, a response. The question is how much of a response from your immune system can, you know, get you protected. If you have a deep infection, likely you'll get some level of immunity, but potentially some of these sailors that were infected early may have had sort of mild infections, which didn't allow their immune response to really mount a true sort of immune protection. And that's really what we need to study. The other possibility is that they were false positives or, and then maybe had some other viral uh, disease, or, you know, frankly, potentially the negative tests were just because the virus at that point was just undetected and detected. So there's a wide range of reasons, um, but clearly understanding immunity is so important for us because A, that impacts our models and how we think we're gonna see this fall wave coming, but two, it really impacts like what the vaccine efficacy will really look like. And, and what about the long-term impacts of COVID-19? I mean, with people who have recovered, even if they had only minor symptoms, will they potentially face health problems down the road? Right. So I think for the vast majority of people that have had mild symptoms, they're going to recover, have a full recovery, just like you would have had any sort of minor cold. Right. I think the question really becomes those who had more severe illness. Right. That were in the hot were hospitalized and potentially had, you know, uh, some issue around organ function, what long lasting issues that they're going to experience. I mean, we often talk about cases and deaths, but we don't really talk about the sort of long term sort of impact on sort of your life post infection. And that's a conversation that really needs to take place. And clearly mental health is another component. But for the vast majority of us that have just finding out that we're infected, maybe through antibody tests, really, there's not going to be any long term consequences of that infection. There seem to be some effective treatments for patients with severe COVID-19 symptoms like blood thinners, remdesivir, and plasma therapy. Do you think that COVID-19 is becoming a less dangerous disease, perhaps, because of these treatment options? Yeah, I think really we shouldn't be cavalier now. Clearly, there's some good evidence around the antivirals that you mentioned. Um, blood thinners are sort of not necessarily clearly shown to be incredibly effective. I think that, you know, we can't um, really treat this virus in any different way until we get the vaccine. So we have to be, you know, really concerned, especially for our vulnerable populations, people with chronic illness, our elderly, you know, they still at the same risk and, and really at the same risk of dying. So we should really maintain our, you know, a high level of, of concern and not really change what we're doing today. And lastly, do you have any indication that the virus is mutating? And if so, could it become any less or more dangerous? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And clearly a virus is constantly evolving. And that, and that evolution is really important for us to understand how the virus travels, how it came from China, where it moved around within the US. But those small mutations aren't really changing sort of the outcomes of, of the virus uh, when we get infected here. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't change form to become more transmissible and you know, mortality could shift. But so far, the evidence really isn't in favor of any real mutation. Now, these coronaviruses do sort of have an evolution, so we're going to keep real, you know, close watch on any changes that we identify. But for now, you know, still the evidence points to it's the same virus, you know, that came out of China. Dr. Brownstein, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.